Good afternoon, and welcome, everybody. I'm David Gertis. I'm the chair of the physics department, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you, uh, all of you here in the room, as well as our audience watching the live stream on YouTube, uh, to the 2022 Taiya Wu Lecture presented by Dr. Ichiro Komatsu, director of the Department of Physical Cosmology at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garking, Germany. <clears throat> I want to extend a special welcome to our friends and supporters from outside the physics department, uh, including our Saturday morning physics friends who uh, have joined us here today. I'm especially grateful for those of you who have uh, supported the department financially. And if you'd like to do that today, there's a little QR code inside your program where you can uh, give us uh, whatever you would like. So um, uh, I also want to say that there is much more to the Tai Ya Wu lecture than just uh, this lecture. It takes really a great deal of planning and effort behind the scenes, starting almost a year in advance to plan this three-day visit that consists of meetings with faculty and with student groups and lunches and dinners. And so in that respect, I want to extend a special thank you to Carol Raybuck there in the back, as well as Holly Wanty in the chair's office for all the work that they've done to make this event a success. <clears throat> and thank you for your stamina for doing the whole three-day three visit. So this lecture series was endowed by Dr. Taya Wu's friends and admirers to honor his remarkable life and legacy as a scientist, a teacher, and a national leader. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the Taiya Wu Lectures, which began in 1992 with a lecture by the Nobel laureate Cien Yang, who was a student of Dr. Wu. Indeed, Taiya Wu's most enduring legacy may be the generations of students that he influenced, both directly as a teacher and a mentor, and indirectly through his highly influential textbooks and as a shaper of national science policy. Dr. Wu was born in China in 1907, and earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1933. His early work predicted the chemical properties of transuranic elements like plutonium before they were discovered. Over the course of the next six decades, Dr. Wu carried out his research in Canada, the US, and in Taiwan. In Canada, he led the theoretical physics division of the National Research Council. He returned to Taiwan in the early 1960s and served as president of the Academic Sinica, the equivalent of our National Academy of Sciences, from 1983 to 1994. He continued lecturing and teaching into his 90s. His legacy as a teacher endures today through events uh, like this. And now I'd like to welcome my colleague, Professor Dragan Hudera, to the stage to introduce this year's Taiya Wu Distinguished Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Um, OK, everyone can hear me. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone who is here in the auditorium. Welcome, people online. It's my great pleasure today to introduce our Taiyu Wu lecturer, Eichiro Komatsu. Eichiro is a world-renowned cosmologist. He uh, an astrophysicist. He works in the area of cosmology, which is trying to understand the history, uh, beginning, and the history and the evolution of the universe trying to understand dark matter and dark energy, cosmological inflation, which is a period shortly after the Big Bang, about which he will talk today about. Um, he is director of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, a department of uh, physical cosmology, where in that department, uh, researchers and students do, do the research that I just mentioned. He received his PhD at Tohoku University in Japan. Then he was a postdoc at Princeton University. He was... Uh, Thereafter, faculty at University of Texas in Austin. After that, he moved to his present position at the MPA. And he tells me that his move from Texas Austin to Munich was purely due to weather considerations, that he and his family <laughs> thought that the weather was more, more pleasant in, in, in Germany. So he's a, at MPA now, where he's a director. He's also honorary professor at Ludwig Maximilians Universität, which is university in Munich as well as a senior fellow at Kabli IPMU, which is a research institution uh, um, in near um, in, in Japan. Um, Eichiro, for his work, I'm going to say a few more words about his work. He won a number of prizes and awards. I will only mention a couple. 
He won the 2012 Gruber Cosmology Prize, as well as 2017 Breakthrough Prize in, fun in Fundamental Physics. And both of them, he uh, and the WMAP team, on which he played an important role, uh, got for their measurement and investigation of cosmic microwave background, which is radiation left over from the Big Bang, about which he will talk about today. Now, one thing that I want to, to mention, no, no, uh, Ichiro, a few more things that are not uh, his degrees and awards, and it more corresponds to something in basketball, this is what we call the mid-range game. You know, kind of the in-between thing that links different corners. Uh, and I think there are a few really interesting and relevant things to mention in that regard. One of them is that his research is extremely broad. So it, uh, within cosmology, typ uh, people typically specialize in one or two things to study. But he studies the distribution of galaxies uh, in order to understand the universe, largely structure, the cosmic microwave background. He studies uh, astroparticle physics, which is uh, high energy particles coming from the cosmos uh, in order to understand fundamental processes in the universe. He compares theory to data, so he analyzes data. He also writes theoretical papers with just pure pencil and paper to work out theoretical predictions of models. So he's, he's very broad. He, I know a lot of people, including me, are quite inspired to see the breadth of his research, and uh, that's played the part in my own attempts to broaden my own research portfolio, as well as of other people that I know. In addition, he is also extremely enthusiastic about research uh, in general. And this infectious enthusiasm really uh, brings up people around him to do the same. Uh, another thing is that he put in significant effort toward making a more diverse workplace. And if you, you know, at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, which is a major institution for astrophysics research worldwide, it looks different today than it did 10 or 15 years ago. Um, there's more diversity across gender ethnic lines. And a lot of it is in large part due to Ichiro's efforts. So there he played, that's what perhaps the most visible change that he's made is, is uh, to make a, a more diverse workplace. Relatedly, he has great interest in supporting and mentoring young students. And uh, if you had a chance to meet with him over the past few days, you would have seen that he has a whole uh, vision of how, how to support young people, how to help them develop their skills to become better researchers, to, to, to obtain both technical skills and social skills in order to succeed in academia and beyond. Um, and that goes beyond just simple mentoring and working with students. So he is particularly well known for that. And that's another thing where I and others have been inspired to see him really very successful in that area. Finally, last and perhaps not least, he has other areas of interest that are not just academic. And one of them is beer. He's expert in beer. If you go to his website, you will see a lot of uh, computer codes and this kind of thing. You'll also see very precise information of where to go and where not to go to have good beer in the city of Munich. <laughs> so uh, also important to know. So with all that, uh, Eichiro, the, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dragon, for this uh, very kind introduction. The only sport I understand is baseball, so I couldn't quite follow your basketball analogy, but thank you very much, <laughs> Uh Yes, indeed. Uh, I spent 13 years in the US, and uh, so four years in New Jersey, nine years in Texas, and uh, then I moved to Munich for weather reasons. But uh, every time I come back to the US, I really you know, uh, remember the, the nice times I spent in this country and then as soon as I arrive, there's one thing that I do all the time, go to the local pub and order IPA, because you don't find it in Munich, right? It's all leather beer, <laughs> which I did, of course, you know, at, at Hopcat. Thank you, for Hopcat, for, for a wonderful time. So it's such an honor to be here. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, also online uh, participations. Thank you very much. So I'm going to tell you about cosmic inflation, uh, it's uh, middle of the week, Wednesday, four o'clock, tired, you know. So I will try to be entertaining. So let the universe begin. So what I'm going to tell you is that uh, cosmic inflation is a period of universe, uh, very dramatic event uh, at the beginning of the time. 
So very, very uh, theoretical idea for a long time, but now we finally have observational data to test this hypothesis. So that's what's changing now, okay? So if you are thinking that I'm going to just tell you about fantasy, right? <laughs> theoretical world, uh, that's not what, what you're going to hear. You're going to hear a lot about data, okay? And I'm trying to convince you by showing the data that we acquired and something like this might have happened. So universe was born, expanded, and then it's hot, dense, opaque. You can't see things because uh, photons are constantly scattered with matter, matter in the universe and they can't propagate straight. Until universe became cooler than 3,000 Kelvin, okay? Then universe will be cleared because Electrons and protons are now combined into forming neutral hydrogen. They don't scatter photons very much. They scatter a little, but not very much. The universe became transparent. Now, one thing that's quite interesting in this animation, which I took from Cosmic Voyage, that's pretty old, uh, IMAX theater movie uh, narrated by Morgan Freeman, uh, very, very well made. Uh, one thing you notice is that these lumps of matter existed pretty much as, fa uh, as soon as the universe was born. If we didn't have those lumps of matter initially, there will be no formation of subsequent structure. These, you see that these lumps, small lumps collide with each other to form bigger and bigger structures. They eventually grow so big that they can host galaxies like Milky Way in which solar system will be formed, then planets you know, are formed, Earth will be born, civilization emerges, some other civilization happened to be in another today listening to my talk, okay? So but all of that initial condition was all set when universe was born. Okay, let's see. So, uh, now you saw this, bright light at the beginning of the universe. Where did they go? Where are they now? The thing is, uh, they didn't go anywhere. They are still with us. So this is the night sky in visible wavelengths you can see by eyes. But if you have a proper detector that can detect photons in microwave frequencies, almost like a radio waves, uh, one centimeter, one millimeter wavelength, then you see this. Just skies filled with light coming from the fireable universe. Then this temperature of the light, which I'll tell you how we measure it, is 2.7 Kelvin, very, very cold. And this is called cosmic microwave background because this one millimeter wavelength is a microwave. And it's background because it's, this light came from, you know, really in the past, very far away. So it's background of everything else we see, okay? Background of, you know, Andromeda, background of all the galaxies and so on. And we can count how many photons are there today, okay? One sugar cube, 410 photons inside of it. Oh, okay, that's pretty, you know, <laughs> significant number of particles. So it's everywhere, okay? So every day you go outside and look up the sky and you think that you are immersed in light from the Big Bang. I mean, these photons are pouring down upon you all the time. It's everywhere with us. But, you know, so Dragon uh, kindly said that I'm a very enthusiastic person. You know, I just talk too much, talk loud. I mean, my mother always said I was born from her mouth. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my school teacher said, whenever I'm silent, I'm sleeping. So, uh, <laughs> but it's very difficult to communicate this. So I love the subject. I love the universe. I love cosmic macro background, everything, right? I love years. So, but... Uh, it's very hard to communicate this enthusiasm because researchers discover new things, but they are terrible at communicating. And uh, then I was thinking, I was very struggling, okay? How can, I, how can I communicate my passion, my love? 
I decided to seek help from the expert, uh, professional communicators. In this case, movie director. Uh, Mr. Kosaka is the uh, movie director specialized in Furudon Panamitarium uh, movies. So we created this horizon beyond the edge of the visible universe, this uh, planetarium movie. It's been shown in a number of planetariums in Japan, as well as in Montreal, Hong Kong. So it's getting you know, worldwide things. Then um, world the first uh, planetarium uh, movie on the CMB. So let's see if we succeed no? uh, <laughs> in uh, really delivering the, uh, explaining the complicated concept. Because once you see the visual, like a movie, hopefully it will help you understand what's going on. So let's begin. The cosmic background radiation was predicted as a consequence of the expansion of the universe. The beginning of the universe was like a dense ball of fire. Everything was immersed in light. It was just like the center of the sun like a fog where light couldn't travel straight. However, when the universe cooled down due to expansion, the fog cleared and light could travel farther. Shouldn't this light reach the Earth today? This light gives us the oldest picture of the universe that we can ever see directly. But the wavelength of this light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. And it has gone past visible light and turned into microwaves. Microwaves that come from every direction at once. That's the evidence for the expansion of the universe. So. This turns out to be very effective. I can speak for hours, but I'll never be able to communicate this concept uh, more clearly than this one. Uh, all the humans here are real humans, but uh, uh, all the backgrounds are computer graphics and music is all original. So it's very, it's very nice. Uh, so indeed, uh, universe expands and the wavelengths of the light is stretched. So when you see bright light at the beginning of the universe, their light you know, can be seen by visible eyes, but then due to the expansion, wavelengths get stretched, now it's in microwave. So uh, if you wanted to detect microwave or radio, you can use this, and uh, just in case young people don't know what that is, it's called a TV, <laughs> okay? And uh, this TV, this ancient TV, is a wonderful receiver of the radio signals. But if you don't uh, tune into the proper frequency, you only see noise. But this noise comes from everywhere, okay? And that everywhere includes a cosmic microwave background. So 1%, calculation shows that 1% of noise in this TV is from the fireball universe. Doesn't require sophisticated uh, machine to do it. But you know, because this, uh, and this uh, TV doesn't really have an antenna that can pick up signal only from the sky, to really probe it, you need a telescope. This telescope uh, was in Bell Lab, and uh, 1964, this gentleman was looking at the sky. They were trying to detect a radio signal from supernova remnant. And uh, Deutsche Museum is, a, uh, is a, one of the biggest science museums in the world. And uh, you see this uh, 1 in 25th model of the uh, antenna on the third floor of Deutsche Museum. It moves. You can, you can point this to anywhere in the sky. It's, it's really cool. It's a gigantic monster, no? if you think about it, OK? Uh, and then this is the real detector system used by uh, Dr. Penjas and uh, Robert uh, Wilson to discover a cosmic micro background. This is once again Deutsche Museum. And then uh, you know, the light comes from the telescope and goes into this home antenna, gets amplified, then goes to this recorder, like this. So you have home antenna, amplifier, and recorder. Now, the system of this detector is just like radio. The radio you know, receives, radio receiver receives signal from the 
station, it amplifies it, right, so that you can hear it and goes to the speaker. What makes it this thing more expensive than radio is this thing here called a calibrator. So this is the uh, very, very cold material cooled down to five Kelvin by liquid helium. Very expensive. Now, why do we need that? Uh, if we wanted to measure the temperature of something, you need a reference. Because you didn't get the noise from the sky. Then what you get is signal in unknown units. But you now compare, you, now you switch your uh, input from sky to this calibrator. Then you know exactly that it's five Kelvin. Then you will then figure out you know, what is really the temperature that you see in the sky. So uh, May 20th, 1964, as soon as these two gentlemen turned on their machine, they, they found that they were in big trouble. Okay, so let me try to explain. Time flows from bottom to up. Intensity of light goes from left to right. So you see a you know, bunch of uh, these uh, lines. So here, look, okay, this is most left, which means coldest. This is when they're looking at calibrator, it's five Kelvin. And when you look at the sky, for example, here, it's elevation 90 degrees, so that's like a zenith. It's higher than five Kelvin, but it shouldn't be. Because people knew that uh, the brightness of the sky at the uh, the wavelengths that they're looking at is not, is not brighter than five Kelvin, it's actually colder. In fact, they, they knew that uh, it has to be 2.3 Kelvin, okay? not 6.7, that's 6.7. Then uh, antenna itself radiates. Okay? Any materials with finite temperature radiate. So this antenna itself emits 0.8 Kelvin of light. The everything else they thought would be below 0.1 Kelvin. Now use subtraction, measured, sky, antenna, everything else, 3.5 Kelvin. That you know is left as unknown. And that they were scratching their head. I don't, they don't really know what's going on. But the one thing, you know, for physics students, I wanted to tell you something. Okay? This is a beautiful experiment that's completely dominated by so-called systematics. If you look at the jitter, this measurement is beautiful, right? There's not much noise in the measurement. This 6.7 Kelvin is measured super precisely, okay? But that your knowledge of every other term is so um, imprecise that the end result is only plus minus 1.0 Kelvin, okay? So systematics is the key. And the reason that they were able to discover this uh, it turns out that this signal is coming from the fireball universe. Reason that, that these two gentlemen could do this measurement was because they are so careful. You could have just given up and say, I don't understand this, I just put this into the, under the rug, okay? Uh, but they didn't do it. They really persisted. So that's, that's, a, that's a very nice thing. Uh, it's a, that shows that they are very good physicists. Now, how do we, oh, hold on. Uh, yes, yeah, okay. So how do we measure the temperature of this thing? So Penjas and Wilson measured uh, their signal at one frequency, wavelengths, but that doesn't really tell you uh, that uh, uh, it comes from the fireball universe. To prove that this comes from the fireball universe, you have to show that the spectrum, namely the brightness of the light, as a function of wavelengths, follows something you expect from the fireball universe. So when you try to make st uh, steel, yeah, you put, uh, coal, you know, you put uh, the ingredients of the steel into the very hot thing, you know, 1,500 degrees or so, 2,000 uh, degrees, 1,500 degrees, then it's a fireball. And if you look at the spectrum of the fireball, it looks like that, yeah? Now you, you measure this thing and then plot the data points. They lie on top of this beautiful Planck curve, and all the quantities are known. So these are uh, fundamental constant, fundamental constant, fundamental constant. The only one variable that you, you don't know is temperature. So if you look at these curves, this magenta curve is four Kelvin, yellow is two Kelvin, 
but green is 2.725 Kelvin, it just fit perfectly. So this means that, because today's universe is not in fireball state, this means that the universe in the past was in a fireball state. So this just shows you that, the data just show you. When people say, it's, you know, we had a big bang in the past, you know, the statement is based upon this amazing data sets. In 1989, the Cosmic Background Radiation Probe, COBE, was launched into space. Observations from outer space without disturbance by the atmosphere brought about a remarkable discovery. The spectrum of the cosmic background radiation matched the theoretical expectation of the Planck distribution. But the best was yet to come. The shape of this curve depends on the temperature of matter that emitted light. Using this property, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation was found to be minus 270.4 degrees Celsius. However, in detail, these curves vary slightly from place to place. That is, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation has fluctuations. So that was a major discovery, okay? So we have uniform sea of photons of 2.7 Kelvin, but if you look in detail, it varies. So to understand this uh, more, more uh, the next uh, satellite, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotopy Probe uh, satellite was launched into the uh, Lagrange 2 point orbit 2001. That's the team. So it's a WMAP science team. This picture was taken at Princeton University for one of the collaboration meetings in 2002. So yeah, much younger. Uh, very good. And uh, all right, so what did we find? So let's look at the uh, sky at various wavelengths, okay? So we start with visible light. And we increase the wavelengths of light to infrared and far infrared and so on, okay? And you immediately see that sky looks very, very differently at different wavelengths, right? So it's very important to measure things at as many wavelengths as possible. You know, if you go to infrared, you can't see it by eye anymore, right? But if you have a specialized apparatus, you can see them, uh, see them, quote unquote. By the time you go to microwave, you get this uniform sea of radiation. Then you, when you uh, improve the sensitivity of your detector by a factor of 100,000, you start seeing these small ripples. These are fluctuations that existed at the beginning of the universe. Remember, at, in the animation I showed, it was very important that lumps of matter existed at the beginning of the time. Otherwise, no structures would follow afterwards, yeah? So that's it. That was the initial irregularities that you needed. So this microwave background data basically showed that our origin was this tiny fluctuations in the early universe. Now, you have these small irregularities that grow gravitationally. So they attract surrounding materials. Materials accrete, it makes it bigger. Bigger things attract more. So, you know, it's a, um, it's a, a runaway process. And eventually, in one of, the, one of those uh, lumps, stars are formed. Around the stars, planets are formed. They collectively form galaxies, eventually some kind of life forms that will emerge on one of the planets or many of the planets, there we go. So uh, that's our origin, okay? So observations of the CMB and interpretation taught us that all structures in the universe originated from tiny fluctuations in the universe. Oh, good, okay, that's pretty cool. So where did the photons come from? So uh, if the photons were emitted here, so let's say that, uh, okay, let me actually go back. So uh, if Big Bang started from the point, which we, we never said it did, but somehow this misconception is quite common. 
then light that was emitted at that point will be gone by now, okay? So we don't see them. So it's important to realize that light was emitted everywhere, okay? Big Bang happened everywhere. And uh, then the light that we see was emitted, oh, so, okay, if light was emitted, oh, sorry. If light was emitted one light, one uh, light year away, then light uh, comes and goes, right, in one year. Uh, so let's see, somewhere here, light, one light year away, comes and goes. So that's not the light we see. That light wasn't emitted one light year away. That light was emitted 14 billion years ago, long, long time ago, far away, far, far away somewhere in space. And they took like 14 billion years to finally reach us, right? They did the work, you know, long, long time. They traveled the universe. Think about it, right? You travel the universe without being scattered, without being absorbed, right? They just came straight to us, right? Of course, there are some other civilizations somewhere in the other universe, other part of the universe that see the light, same light, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we see, okay? So that means something interesting. So we are here, we're looking farther in distance. This is distance, okay? But that automatically means we're seeing the universe as, uh, as it was in the past. But this process, you, you just keep watching, keep going in deep into the distant universe. You can't see beyond this moment that the uh, cosmic micro background was emitted, the universe became transparent, okay? You can't see beyond that. But I wanna see beyond. Nobody can stop me, so what do we do? <laughs> we use laws of physics, okay? Uh, we can see this. They use this as a boundary condition to reconstruct what happened before that you, by solving differential equations, so you have a gravitational Einstein equations, energy conservation equation, momentum conservation equation. Look at, you know, this, this is the basic, okay? If any physicist, okay, can't, they're free to do whatever they want, but uh, there are two things that they can't violate, energy conservation and momentum conservation, okay? So you have energy conservation, momentum conservation, and gravitational field, and put them all together, and you get sound waves. The cosmic background radiation is the wall at the edge of the visible universe. We cannot see directly the further past beyond this wall. But these temperature fluctuations may tell us what happened in the further past. The conditions beyond the wall of the cosmic background radiation could be thought of as a liquid with high temperature and high density. You could say it was like a hot soup. Something happened behind this wall that made waves, which can be seen in the fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation. There must have been a grand sound that shook the universe. We can learn a great deal about the universe if we can extract this cosmic sound. The origin of the sound would be the moment of the birth of the universe. In other words, early universe was like a miso soup, okay? That's, the, that's how universe looked, okay? So it's not transparent. <laughs> and uh, you, you see then you start dropping tofus, you know, into this soup. And uh, depending upon, you know, how ripples are created in the hot soup, like miso soup, you can figure out what miso soup is made of, you know, how much miso there is, how much shoyu, how much, you know, seaweeds and stuff, okay? I'm not joking, actually, I'm very serious because the equations that govern the physics, physics of miso soup and physics of the universe is, are, are the same. <laughs> so, uh, so depending upon you know, uh, which uh, miso you're using, you get different patterns of ripples. And maybe, after all, that's what we see in the sky, yeah? There you go. All right, so let me show you how this works. 
How do we analyze the data like that? So we have basically values of temperatures depending on the location in the sky, and they're fluctuating, like ripples. So typically, when physicists are faced with such fluctuating data, we decompose them into a set of cosine and sines called Fourier transform. So decompose temperature fluctuations in the sky into a set of waves with various wavelengths, so long wavelengths, short wavelengths. Amplitudes are then fitted to describe the data, okay? Then we square the amplitude and plot the amplitude of the waves, strength of the waves, as a function of the inverse of the wavelengths. This is called the power spectrum, and there you go, boom. It looks like that. Now, uh, this is long wavelengths, this is short wavelengths. You see one nova wavelength in the x-axis. You see, run, 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 right? Waves. This proves that the universe behaved like miso soup in the past. And uh, how does it work? So, uh, so you, you are given the sky here, and then try to decompose this sky into a set of sine and cosines, yeah? Like that. And then, uh, you know, this uh, largest scale has wavelengths that's as big as the sky itself. And as you go to the right, you start seeing the smaller and smaller structures. And by the time you're done with decomposing everything, you might as well put them all together back, and you will recover, of course, the original image that you started with. Yeah, it's easy. And uh, so indeed, the Jim Peebles, uh, a professor at the Princeton University, in 1970, he said with his student, you, uh, something remarkable, universe was hot soup. Yeah? He didn't say that exactly, but, uh, and he's uh, a Canadian, so probably he was thinking about clam chowder, although it doesn't really work out. Reason why I chose miso soup is that, uh, I don't know if you ever dropped uh, clam into clam chowder, but it just doesn't do anything, okay? It's too, too viscous, too thick, that it doesn't just work. In Germany, we drop potato into potato soup, it doesn't do anything, right? So it turns out that uh, miso soup is the best example. Uh, so, it's, uh, <laughs> so he said, universe was like a hot soup and there must be sound waves, 1970. Now we finally see them. Yeah. After 30 years, this bold you know, claim was made from theoretical physics, took the experimentalist only 30 years to discover that. It's, yeah. So, oh yeah, so this uh, drawing is very nice. Uh, this is how he exactly looks. So this was a wonderful conference in Goa. Uh, it's sunshine, you know, uh, in the, wh why are we holding umbrellas? Because uh, East Asians, like, uh, you know, Japanese, Taiwanese, they, they really care about skins. Uh, and then even in the uh, sunshine, they just, you know, have this uh, umbrella. <laughs> and uh, I think Jim has never seen it. So he wanted to, <laughs> so this is, uh, uh, this is my wife's umbrella. This is my wife's uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, friend's umbrella, and then, you know, well, well, it's a happy moment before pand pandemic, yeah, 2011. And uh, in the meantime, uh, 1970, you know, former Soviet Union, Rashid Sunyaev uh, and Yakov Zerodovich said exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing, predicted in the different parts on Earth. So, you know, when humans are onto something really important, it usually happens simultaneously at different locations. And uh, that's 2003, that's Sunyaev, that's me. He was my superhero. I wanted to take a picture with him. He was, uh, and he still is, uh, the director at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. He's now retired, and uh, he, he was a director of the institute. And then, you know, if I will tell him that uh, you will be his colleague, you know, uh, le much later, he will probably just faint, okay? <laughs> so life is very interesting. We can use a computer calculation to recreate the state of the universe with sound travel through. The universe at this time was dense and became like 
liquid, such as a soup. Ingredients of the soup are the same as those in today's universe. Matter that makes stars and galaxies. And dark matter and dark energy exist, even though they cannot be seen directly by our eyes. Galaxies can keep their shapes thanks to dark matter providing gravity. It's thought that the universe's expansion is gradually speeding up due to some dark energy pushing space apart. These are the three main ingredients of the soup. Space expanded with time. Let's give some impact to the beginning of this model. Great. I have a pattern for the cosmic background radiation. The reason that this particular pattern does not match our observations is because the ratio of ingredients in the soup is wrong. Waves do not travel through in a thick soup like they do in a thin soup. I'll use the power spectrum to make the patterns match. I have to adjust the ingredients to make my calculation agree with the data. Incredible! The visible part of the universe, like stars and galaxies, makes only 5%. The universe is dominated by invisible components. That's right. That's very interesting. But that's not the subject of today's lecture. Today's lecture is about... Let's give some impact to the beginning of this model. Who gave the <laughs> initial impact? How? Okay. What gave the initial fraction to the hot cosmic hot soup? Some impact was made at the beginning created the sound waves. If there was no impact, no sound waves, right? What happened there? A leading idea is nobody gave an impact. Impact emerged quantum mechanically from the vacuum. All right? What's going on? Uh, because quantum fluctuations are microscopic scale phenomena. In this room, there are quantum fluctuations on the small scales. But formation of galaxies is a very, very big scale. What's the missing link between them? What connected small and large? That's where cosmic inflation comes in. So when you combine gravity and quantum, that explains the origin of all structures we see in the universe. Cosmic inflation is an exponential expansion of space. And in the very, very early universe, some quantum fluctuations are occurring on a very small scale that's then uh, stretched enormously by exponential expansion of space to macroscopic scales. That's the origin of everything we see in the universe, including yourself. What? How can we believe such a statement? And uh, luckily, we're doing science. We don't have to believe in anything. We just measure them and test the hypothesis. Only the data will decide. So, cosmic inflation. Due to expansion of space, distance between two points is stretched in proportion to some quantity called A. When space doubles, A is two, triple, three. Then we define called Hubble expansion rate. Uh, that's, you know, A, uh, so derivative of A over A. So this has the unit of one over time. In other words, if you integrate, A is exponential of H over T, and if H is constant, A is exponential. So this inflation requires this H quantity to be roughly constant. But inflation has to end, uh, so H is decreasing with time. That's the prediction of inflation. Let's test it, okay? Then we need quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics then just gives you fluctuations from the vacuum. 
in strength of that fluctuation is proportional to this H quantity. H is decreasing over time, okay? Now, as inflation proceeds, fluctuations are generated. They are stretched to large scales. Next time, another fluctuation is generated, stretched. Another one, stretched. Another one, stretched. But because the large, the earlier the fluctuations, they're stretched longer. So they will then subtain the uh, longer wavelengths in the sky. In other words, if you see longer wavelength fluctuations in the sky, that must have been generated earlier during inflation. And because H has to decrease over time, inflation predicts that longer wavelength fluctuations should be higher, stronger, than the shorter wavelength fluctuations. That's the prediction. But if you look at the power spectrum, it's like, uh, 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 right? it's not like, oh, larger scale is slightly uh, stronger than smaller scale. It's like a waves, what's going on? We know what's going on, it's a missile soup. It's a sound waves. Sound waves complicate analysis because this doesn't really preserve the initial conditions, but we can get rid of this waves because now we know what the universe is made of, right? So we can just remove uh, ripples, uh, remove sound waves. Then you see this primordial fluctuations, the initial condition of the universe. Then, uh, you know, depending on what the, what the inflation is doing, you get this, this kind of behavior. So let's parameterize the amplitude of wave in the power law is ns minus one. And if ns is less than one, that means stronger fluctuation on larger scale than small scale. That's what we, that's what the inflation predicted. 1994, Colby measured only this portion, so it's very, very, uh, you know, uh, nice measurement, but not very precise enough to see whether NS is less than one or not. 2012, WMAP did this measurement. It's less than one, but compared to ERAVA, it's not very com compelling, or convincing evidence. Then we combine WMAP, which has only small dash, with big telescope on the ground so that they can measure very, very small scale fluctuations. We have now longer lever arm to do more precise measurement. It's good, but you know, if you wanted to say to your kids that you came from, I mean, kids ask questions, right? They were like, oh, mom, where did I come from? And you say, yeah, right? Then uh, they ask you, oh, uh, mom, uh, where did you come from? And you say, came from your grandma. And then, uh, then they say, we came from ocean. We came from, you know, earth, uh, solar system, protoplanetary disk, galaxy. Then they ask, where did the galaxy come from? You say, just go to bed. It's none of their business. Okay. <laughs> But now you can say it's a quantum fluctuation <laughs> right? from the early universe. But if you want to say that to your kids, you better be sure <laughs> that your measurement is precise, right? So, so when we then combine these data sets with uh, distribution of galaxies and other data sets, we finally got this you know, so-called five sigma discovery of NSS one So hallelujah, 2012, very exciting moment. But because we are combining different data sets, uh, we are a little bit worried that uh, maybe we're fooled by some unknown systematics, right? Uh, then, uh, subsequent year, uh, the uh, European Space Ag Agency uh, published the first result from another uh, satellite called Planck, right? So that was the third generation cosmic microwave background uh, satellite, and they measured really beautiful results coming only from the cosmic micro background data. Then, then the same, same, same answer as we got. So that's, the oh, oh, good, okay. So we actually did something correctly. When two independent data sets give you the same answer, that, that's, that's a good indication, yeah? All right, now something else. Quantum fluctuations uh, on the ground state give you the wave, wave function that is a Gaussian distribution, this bell-shaped Gaussian distribution. So this is the prediction, okay? Bell shape. This is the histogram of temperature values 
across all the, all the sky, minus mean temperature, so zero means mean temperature, then higher fluctuations, lower fluctuations. Yeah? Data looks like that. Look at this. So this seems to be very strong indication that these fluctuations originated from quantum mechanical vacuum fluctuations. I mean, I know that it's, it's just too much to take, right? I mean, oh, we came from quantum fluctuations? What, what is that? And has the inflation really happened? I mean, if you ask me, yeah, sure, right? Uh, NS is less than one. Gaussian fluctuations, I didn't talk about other things, but you know, there's all checked. I mean, what more do we want? What, you know, what more proof do you want, right? But Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. If you really wanted to say to your kids, well, your grandkids, you came from quantum fluctuations, we probably have to have something more. That's gravitational wave. Gravitational waves are distortions in space. When they are coming toward you, okay? I mean, you can't visualize them, but what they do is to just change distances between two points. So when you have ring of particles on the screen and their gravitational waves are coming toward you, they distort uh, distances between two points in an isotropic way like this. They preserve areas and they distort, distort uh, distances like that. Now, when you put them into the homogeneous sea of radiation, like cosmic microwave background, they stretch space. Wavelengths get longer, shorter, longer, shorter. Longer, sh uh, wavelengths longer means colder, okay? And shorter wavelengths means hotter. So when you put an electron here, okay, they see hotter photons coming from the above and below and colder photons coming from the side. When this photon is get scattered by electron and coming toward you, okay? This photon is scattered and coming toward you. This light is polarized. Why? So this means that the electric field has a, a preferred direction like this. So let's look at the car. You have a windshield, sunny day, sunshine is coming from the above. And this sunshine gets scattered by the windshield and coming toward you. This is horizontally polarized, okay? How do we know that? So if we actually have polarized sunglasses, which will block horizontally polarized light, but only transmit the vertical one, you see through the car, right? So you know this light is polarized. When light is scattered, it creates polarization. So that's really the key, yeah? So electron scatters light and it's polarized. This is temperature map, it's polarized. Yeah, it's measured. And then you can decompose this uh, polarization pattern into two sets of patterns. One is like, so when you have this hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, this creates a wave, right? And compared to the wave, is the polarization direction parallel to a perpendicular 45 degree tilted. So this is the uh, direction of the wave and then parallel to or perpendicular to that or 45 degree tilted. Now, why is this important? Seems like a technical thing. So this is important because when you flip the uh, spatial coordinates, this B mode changes the sign, but E mode doesn't. So this is telling you something about the parity of parity symmetry in the universe. So you can pro use this to probe something that violates parity is something that doesn't, okay? And it turns out that the sound waves don't generate B, they only generate E, whereas gravitational waves generate both E and B. So this is, you know, you saw this temperature and isotropy, now we measure E mode polarization really precisely. This is coming, through, coming from sound waves. And this B mode coming from gravitational lensing of this, and this also measured, and this, this is the uh, uh, B mode coming from gravitational waves, okay? From the early universe. That's yet to be measured. But let, I just wanted to say something, okay? So uh, 
Sound waves are predicted in 1970, and this finally discovered in 2000, 30 years. Since then, measurements improved seven orders of magnitude in another 20 years, only 20 years. Okay? And this really shows that uh, once people convince that there's something out there worth measuring, they'll measure it. Okay? So, uh, I mean, it takes a long time, it seems like, but it's only you know, 30 years or 20 years. It's short, and, if, and you get this. Okay? So, uh, I mean, science takes time, but, uh, but it's worth it. So let's try to find gravitation wave, and we have this convenient quantity called tensor to scalar ratio r. And the current, you know, we only have an upper bound because we haven't found anything. So this is, you know, our achievement, and then we have tensor to scalar ratio on the y-axis, and s, x-axis, and s is less than one. That's very good, but we don't have detection of gravitation wave yet. 2013, 2015. Right, so blue, look at blue. Blue gets smaller, smaller, smaller. We, found, we haven't found it yet. It's a painful, it's a painful process, but we, we want to find it, okay? So what comes next? Uh, we, are, we are doing this measurements. This requires many, many microwave sensors. When I was going into this area of research. We had the microwave sensor camera that has seven pixels. That was state of the art. Since then, people are convinced that this is a really good thing to do. So there's a Moore's law, almost like a reduction of uh, error, of error, noise, as a function of the uh, year. It's an exponential reduction in the sensitivity. And now we are talking about having camera with uh, hundreds of thousands of pixels. And you know what? You never need this for any other applications. This technical breakthrough innovation was made just for the science of cosmic micro background, right? So uh, now, sometimes people ask me, what is your science good for? And my answer is, I don't know, but I have this amazing machine. Okay, I mean, we didn't build it for some daily applications, but it's a society's, it's a society's uh, job to find the usefulness you know, of the technology. We just make technologies, okay? Uh, just wanted to find the beginning of the universe. But, but our, our technology must be useful for something. <laughs> and uh, I'm asking you to just find the usefulness of such a technology. So we have lots of ground-based observatories making this measurement. It may be tomorrow that you find an announcement that they found gravitational waves from inflation, and all the structures came from quantum mechanical fluctuations. Now, these are uh, university-led uh, efforts, and each experiment is about $10 million. Now, we are getting to the point where that doesn't seem enough. Okay? So then we join the force together and create are uh, something like 100 million experiments. So Chilean experiments, 100 million. South Pole experiments, 100 million. If that's not, not enough, we combine everything. And that will be 600 million. Okay, this is CMB stage four experiment. That will be happening late 2020s. It's right there, okay, it's very soon. If that's not enough, we launch yet another satellite. Oh, sorry. If that's enough, we, we launch balloons. Okay? Balloons are almost a satellite, but much cheaper. If that's not enough, we launch a satellite. So uh, NASA launched COBE, WMAP. ESA, European Space Agency, launched Quank. Now, for the first time, Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, will launch Lightbird, that's the uh, design specifically to measure polarization. None of the previous generation of experiments was specifically designed to look for polarization. So we'll hope to do a much better job and find gravitational waves from inflation and show that we all came from quantum fluctuations. So let me summarize. 
Frankly, it looks, inflation looks very, very good, okay? So we're almost convinced that we all came from quantum fluctuations, but next frontier, we wanted to find the definitive evidence for inflation by detecting gravitational waves. And uh, over the next 10 years, we hope to see it from ground-based and balloon experiments. But then, uh, once it's found, we also want to have a definitive measurement of gravitational wave by the satellite emission light bulb. And I hope that 10 years from now, or maybe 15 years from now, uh, I can tell you, you know, where you came from. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ichiro, for that, for that great talk. That was terrific. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, I'd like to take a brief pause so that our student assistants can grab microphones and head out. And, and those of you who would like to leave now are free to get up and do so. And so in about a minute or so, we'll start with uh, some questions. So if you do have a question, please um, just raise your hand and someone with the microphone will find you and then you can uh, speak into the microphone so that the rest of us can hear you. Hello, Professor. Uh, my name is Chingwei, and thank you for the uh, real, really interesting topic. So I got one question when you talk about that the photons we see come from really far away. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, is it related to anything like the information theory about the hologram principle? Oh, OK. So holographic principle tells you that um, we know that to gain information of, of something inside of the volume, you don't have to know everything about the uh, space inside, but only the surface, right? So all the information about what's inside is encoded in the surface. Uh, no, this uh, doesn't really uh, relate to that. Uh, if possible, we, we, we would have loved to see photons coming from everywhere. But it so happens that um, because photons come and go, we have only access to photons that were emitted at a specific time, right? So this uh, because surface around us. If we wait it more, we see more photons coming from more distant place, right? So then we can scan the volume. So yeah, but uh, this so this isn't really related. In fact, if this was related to holographic principle. We, that's it, right? That's all we can learn because everything is contained in the surface. But that's not the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your talk. So I was wondering, since you said that the waves lengthened to uh, microwaves due to the expansion of the universe, is there a possibility that there are even longer waves like radio waves from the beginning of the universe that we've just not detected yet? or waves that have such a low amplitude that we've just not seen that are even older from the beginning, or? Very good. So let me show you this uh, uh, spectrum of cosmic microwave background. So when the uh, uh, photons were at a specific temperature, you might think that light is emitted at a specific wavelength that corresponds to that temperature. That's not the case. It's emitted everywhere. So uh, wavelength is longer here. And as you go to longer and longer and longer and longer, longer you know, 30 centimeters, well, even meters, something is there, but only little. Yeah. So yes, I mean, you, you do get photons in a very, very longer wavelengths, but uh, not, not, not so much. Yeah. Professor uh, Kamasu. I have a question about hmm, uh, the force that drives inflation. How is it different than the force that drives the normal expansion of the universe? And why inflation is so rapid than a normal expansion? Yeah. So uh, let me just answer the last question first. Uh, why inflation is different from the uh, normal expansion? 
we don't know. Okay. So basically what we know is that if we assume such a rapid radical expansion in the early time, we can explain our data. In other words, if we didn't have inflation, we wouldn't be able to explain what we see. Right? So uh, what's powering inflation? You know, there's a mysterious energy component that drives exponential expansion. We don't know what that is. But uh, maybe by finding, so uh, uh, that's actually a um, good opportunity to say that I showed you this kind of diagram here. Uh, gravitational waves, amplitude, and, and S. Each dot corresponds to a different fundamental physics model that drives inflation. So by identifying, you know, currently you know, all of these are cons uh, in agreement with data. Now we are you know, somewhat in a different situation where uh, many other models are gone, but you know, these, these are all corresponding. They have even names. Natural inflation, you know, uh, one of the proposals is uh, in the audience today, we are very fortunate, Hilltop Quartic Inflation, which is very, very funny names. Uh, they correspond to completely different physical mechanisms. And maybe one day, by measuring gravitational wave and measuring NS very precise, we can say, yes, we are, oh, what is this? <laughs> we are B phi to the two thirds. Okay? <laughs> then, then we know more about what powered the inflation. We're not there yet, but we'll get there. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, once I met a person who is not a physicist who asked the following question. And the question was, if I imagine the universe being this room, and I understand that if you have a bunch of lasers there on all the time, I will see photons going through here, right? Yes. So when I turn off the lasers, yes. the photons disappear. That's right. So I, I was falling apart trying to find an explanation and say, well, the universe is like an optical cavity. Okay. What, what would you say that, to that person that asked that question? So, uh, the universe an optical cavity or? So first of all, be, okay, let me actually first say something about what you said at the beginning. Namely, if I turn off the laser, you don't see it anymore, right? But that's not, so I don't know if you imply this, but uh, for cosmic micro background, light was never turned off. So light is always on. And we receive light from farther and farther and farther distances, okay? Now cavity implies the universe is finite. <laughs> we don't know that yet, okay? So, okay, so you, what you're implying is universe can be finite, therefore, only specific wavelengths of light are contained inside of it. Could be, why not? Yeah, uh, but uh, we haven't found yet evidence for finiteness of the universe. And that's kind of unfortunate because we can see so much of the universe because light travel time is finite. We have looked everywhere to find evidence for finiteness of the universe for a long time, but haven't found any. What that means is that it's unlikely that we'll find it anytime soon because we, we, we see everything we can see already, right? Yeah, so, but that means that uh, we already have lower bound to the uh, number of waves we can contain inside of the universe if you follow this cavity. Yeah. Is that good enough? Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, uh, I got one question. Uh, I'm confused by the term sound waves. Yes. So what do you exactly mean by sound waves? Thank you very much. So that's a physicist jargon. All that means is it's a longitudinal wave uh, or density wave. Yeah. And, uh, but physicists say, use this word loosely, sound waves loosely for any longitudinal waves. <laughs> 
are there any experiments being conducted with a web telescope that will help in the research that your theory that you're doing? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not specifically for this cosmic microwave background research. However, uh, big question is, okay, universe was born and evolved, the inflation and all that, right? But then what happened afterwards? So you have this uh, moment that the universe became transparent. And then there's really nothing happening. The first of stars are formed, finally. We haven't seen this moment yet. Webb will be the first telescope, because it's big enough, to really see the light coming from the first structure, the first of stars. So some people say this is the last frontier of astrophysics. We haven't seen it yet. I mean, that would be tremendously you know, helpful yeah, for cosmology. On. <laughs> I think it, OK. Thanks for, for the nice talk. So you showed uh, they're really getting like really good data for studying inflation in the future. I'm just wondering how well do we understand like foregrounds and other systematic effects and how much of a challenge it will be to actually measure those B modes and understand? Yeah. So what he's asking is um, when you look at the microwave sky, um, there's a something that I didn't tell you, uh, namely, what is this thing in the middle? This is the light coming from the, our own Milky Way. Our own Milky Way is full of stuff, full of atoms. They emit light, and they contaminate the uh, microwave background measurements. Yeah. Now, uh, this uh, cosmic microwave background has a specific spectrum that's Planck distribution, fireball universe light. This is not. So if you make measurements at multiple different wavelengths, you can tell apart between cosmic and microwave background and everything else. If you do that, then, then you can actually get something that looks like this. It's cleaned. Yeah. So the question is, to what extent we can do this? Okay? When you go faint and faint and faint. The answer is, when this uh, tensor to scalar ratio parameter that I was telling you about, you know, we are really crazy to go after this, the single quantity R. Current upper bound is 0 0.036. We can go down to 0 0.001, but not further. Yeah. So that's the target of space mission light part. So we designed the experiment so that we, we make sure that we get down to that level and that will be the limit set by cleaning of galactic foreground. Yeah. Uh, Time for one or two more questions. Uh, okay. Um, is there a cosmic variance limit on the like constraint for R, or cosmic? Sorry. Like, is there some kind of cosmic variance limit? Like, is there a cosmic like, ray? Like variance. variance. A cosmic variance. Like limit on R, like how well we can measure theoretically, or can we just push lower and lower in perpetuity? Very good. So, so this is related to the question we just answered. So this, this measurement is not limited by cosmic variance. This measurement is limited by the, our ability to model and subtract galactic foreground and instrumental noise. In the limit of uh, zero instrumental noise, this will be 0 0.001 because of our ability to subtract galactic foreground emission. It's not due to cosmic variance. Yeah. Which is good and bad, right? We never hit by cosmic variance, but we were hit by galactic emission. And to remove that, you have to go out of Milky Way. And I don't know, it's going to take 100,000 years. Right? So <laughs> why not, I guess? Mm -hmm. <laughs> This might just be me being slightly confused, but like I know when like light passes through air versus when it passes through water, its speed like changes slightly. Mm -hmm. So how do we know that the light as it passes through the universe's speed isn't changing and it's not like bending or the wavelength isn't like being affected by its long distance transport through space? 
Very good. So in fact, uh, they are they are bent. <laughs> uh, so look, let's look at this. Uh, so I draw this right as if nothing happens to this wave. In reality, because of these cosmic structures, light is bent by gravitational force. And they're bent, and this bent can be understood as light propagating at different speed uh, under the gravitational potential. So you can define refractive, refractive index and then do the math. Yeah. Thank you again. That was a wonderful lecture and, and discussion. Let's let's thank our speaker. Very much.